in my opinion, if universities are going to remain as significant to society as they have been during that time, they have to modernise. And a lot of this is embracing technology. Edinburgh's under my predecessor, uh, Edinburgh has been um, putting a lot of effort into digital uh, education, both internally and externally. Um, and I think we've made a very good start, and I want to build on that because I think that's the, that ability to modernise a very ancient university that has very standard, established, rather traditional ways of doing things, that's exactly the challenge and that's what makes it interesting. I think and that's really one of the reasons why I wanted to come to this conference because I need to learn from you. So um, as you well know and I know from years of experience, telling uh, academic faculty uh, how to do things or what to do is not a very productive uh, uh, method. Um, and so it's got to be a process of engagement and a process of um, almost getting people to believe that this is the right way to, to, to plan the future. And so, um, we, for example, we put a lot of effort into staff development. So at the same time as developing the technological platforms for online learning, whether this, is, whether this means uh, externally with MOOCs and, and, and online courses, or internally for our on-campus students, Obviously the technological platform is very important and we've worked hard to develop that. But as well as that, we have to provide staff development, we have to provide education in the methodologies, what works well, what doesn't work well, uh, encouraging innovation uh, and, and, and a focus as much on the people as on the technology seems to us to be the right approach. Yeah, I think so. And also, I mean, my so running a university basically is a is a people management job. It's basically, I mean, there's a bit of money management as well, but um, but it's basically about managing people. And people um, respond well to anything which makes gets them interested, gets them excited, allows them to think that we're trying to make their job easier or more interesting, rather than they don't respond well to anything which seems to them like it's going to make their life more complicated or they're going to have more hurdles to jump over and so I think it's that, it's that sense of facilitating uh, technological developments which is really important and I think the other thing, this comes back a bit to the fo focus on people in the strategy 2030, the generation that really knows technology and really understands it and knows how to use it is not me, it's actually my students um, and I think the, the, you know, these, these young people have grown up with, with these handheld devices, they, 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 they live their world, they live their lives through these devices in a way that when I was a kid I didn't and so to to understand the the way they want to receive their information the way they want to receive their education there's no substitute in my opinion from talking to them and listening to the younger generation so engaging with the students engaging with the younger staff uh, and the technological experts seems to me to be the right way to, to, to develop our, our future. So, so we were an early um, uh, Edinburgh was an early adapter, uh, early adopter of, of MOOCs. So um, uh, again, that was before I arrived. But we have 2.7 million people enrolled on, on our MOOCs. So we have a very large sort of MOOC population, if you like. And, and I think uh, actually the same was true of the University of Hong Kong, where I was before I moved to Edinburgh. We also had uh, very early MOOCs, um, and so that 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 was the first. Um, large-scale example of online education and at the time people were predicting that this meant the end of the university as we know it and that this was going to replace universities. I never believed that. The year of the MOOC. Yeah, I, I never believed that that was the case and, and, and so it's proved. I mean the, the, the population that undertake MOOCs is different from the population that undertake university education largely, largely older and maybe, maybe people returning to education or, or taking up education for the first time. So. Uh, I think MOOCs are an addition to uh, universities rather than a replacement for them. But then what's happened I think in the time since the MOOC revolution is that people have started to think, well actually online education is about far more than MOOCs. Um, it's about much more, you know, these, I like these micromasters. We've just launched uh, the, the UK's first micromasters in collaboration with edX. And I know that uh, Anand Agrawal is another speaker at the conference. Yes, he's somebody yes. I've worked with both in Hong Kong and since I've been in Edinburgh. And I'm very proud of the fact that Anand says that he believes the University of Edinburgh is the, the best university outside North America for online education. So we're very proud of that uh, accolade and we have to work hard to keep that up because now the competition is very fierce. Everybody now is looking to see how they can develop online education. But in collaboration with uh, Anand and his colleagues at edX, We've launched the MicroMasters, that's in predictive analytics in the business school. And we have 
uh, two more MicroMasters ready to ready to launch. So we think that's a model that will that will be uh, very effective. So you, 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 you can gather some people that may later go on and do a, a formal masters, or they may not. But whatever, they get some credentials from the MicroMasters. Um, and then I think the most exciting of all is the way that we're trying to think about using digital education for our regular on-campus students. We know that, um, for example, we now record all our lectures um, and students like that. They like the, they like the ability to access the lectures uh, outside the actual timetable lecture time. Um, and, and we're learning with some very interesting uh, learning analytics um, about the way they use those lecture recordings. They, they don't sit down and listen to the whole lecture again. What they do is they scan through and find a particular piece that they wanted to get clarified or a particular section. So the average use of those lecture recordings is quite short. And when I first saw that data, I thought that suggested that we were not making something that was very interesting or informative. But I'm told by people that know more about this than me that, no, that's wrong, actually. That's exactly the way you would predict that young people will use lecture recordings because that's the way they, they're used to accessing information in small, small bites. So there's some examples there, and then I think the the other thing that I think we feel that we've done well, and I mentioned this before, is the is the aspect of staff development. You know, we have this slogan that every teacher should be a digital teacher, and so we have at the moment only a subset of our faculty that really actively embrace digital learning, um, and we have many more that don't. And it's either because they don't have the technological ability, or they, they haven't ever been exposed to the excitement that can be digital learning. Uh, or they feel somehow rather suspicious or rather uncertain about it. And so we think providing staff development so that every teacher that's providing online learning has had some uh, education, some qualification for themselves, we think that's also very important so that we're not just educating the, the students but we're educating the staff as well. So that's absolutely right and I heard a fabulous example recently which, which I I was at a, there was a conference in in Edinburgh called the Spanish Tertulias. I didn't know what a Tertulias was, but it basically means a convening of you know this word convening of minds for a discussion of a relevant topic. And at this meeting, there was a lot of discussion about artificial intelligence. And one of the uh, overseas delegates related an anecdote which I thought was really instructive. So he said that there was a you know on Amazon if you buy um, a product when you get to the bottom of the page it says you may also be interested in the following, or previous people that bought this also bought this. Um, and apparently that linkage is done by artificial intelligence, so no humans are involved, this is just pattern recognition. And uh, the example was that someone bought um, a set of uh, pétons, the, the, the metal bull that French people play to play bull in the, in the street, in the, in the town squares. Um, and someone bought a, a set of these metal bull um, and at the bottom of the page, when uh, it suggested what else that this person might wish to buy, the items that came up were a yellow vest, a gilet jaune, and a gas mask. Uh, so the suggestion was that someone had bought Boule and then was also buying a yellow vest and a gas mask. And of course this is a, a, a reputational concern for Amazon, and so apparently what Amazon did in response to that was introduce, reintroduce a human being to sense check that kind of association so that you can't just make it automatic, someone has to sense check it. And I find that quite reassuring that there's still a role for human beings. You can't always make these linkages without somebody, a, a human, saying does this make sense or does this have any reputational consequences. So there's an example, if you like, of where a little bit of regulation or a little bit of human intervention uh, makes artificial intelligence more effective. So um, there are many challenges, but we, you're right, we do believe that this can't just be words, this has got to be actions, we've got to be able to measure and demonstrate our own commitments. Um, so we're rapidly trying to convert all of our vehicles to electric vehicles, we have a lot of a fleet of vehicles that are involved in the university, we're converting those to electric vehicles, so that, and I know there are arguments about the sustainability of electric vehicles, mm -hmm. but we generally feel that that's the right thing to do. All of our new buildings are built according to sustainable principles, so you know, we're trying to have uh, modern forms of heating and energy generation. Um, but we have to be realistic. Firstly, the, the university uh, has 550 buildings across Edinburgh and many of them are old. And so many of them are not uh, environmentally friendly. Um, so we have to modernise to the extent that we can, but we have to accept that some of those buildings will, will, will be much more of a challenge in, in terms of sustainability. 
And the other thing which I've tried to articulate in the time that I've been there is that I think the realistic um, assessment of our position in terms of climate sustainability has to include recognition that if we want to be a research intensive university and we want to have international credentials, then we are going to generate a carbon footprint. We, it, it's, it's unavoidable. We have international, 43% of our students are from outside the UK. And so a lot of those students travel and they travel home. So there's a lot of air travel involved. We have our researchers traveling around the world, uh, in, talking at conferences and interacting with other researchers. And then we have some activities. We, we've got the UK's supercomputer based in Edinburgh. Uh, and obviously that generates an enormous carbon footprint. So we can't be, uh, we can't hide from the fact that we're going to generate a carbon footprint. What I think we have to do is we have to take every step we can to minimise that, the, things, you know, the types of things we've talked about, but also to offset, genuinely offset our carbon footprint in other ways. And so we're interested in, in uh, planting trees and regenerating peat bogs in Scotland, where Scotland has very large rural areas where we can genuinely produce carbon offset. This is not a question of buying carbon offset from some other source. This is about planting new trees and regenerating peat bogs so that we're contributing to carbon offset uh, nationally. And um, I think that combination, doing, doing the things that we can to reduce our carbon footprint, but also recognizing that the reality of our activities is that we're going to generate a carbon footprint, which we then need to measure and offset. That's the basis of our strategy. And we, on the, with that, uh, paired set of approaches, we think we can deliver carbon neutrality uh, by 2040, that's our pledge.